that a couple of settings are right here. Have you already allowed me to share my screen? If I have any questions, put them in the chat window and we'll get to those uh, uh, at, the end of the, at the end of the talk. Should take about 45 minutes or so. I want to speak to you today a little bit about how Rome has recycled itself over its many centuries of existence. <clears throat> and this recycling can be in a material form, reusing the material of the past city and new buildings, but also the idea of reiterating uh, old ideas, simple ideas into something ever more complex as you layer these ideas upon themselves and reinterpret them again and again through the centuries. We can see in the photo on the left that part of Rome's existence has been its continual destruction and reconstruction, often out of the same material and often out of the same ideas. Hey, Sam, I want to remind you if you were planning on recording this lecture, now would be the time to do it. Uh, we are recording, Scott. So. Oh, fantastic. All right, well, let's move on, but there's something I want to say before we get started. First, I want to say happy birthday, Rome, 2,773 years young. The legend of the founding of Rome dates back to Republican times several hundred years BCE, and that date is said to be the 21st of April, 753 BCE. Now, it's remarkable that we're still celebrating this birthday all of these thousands of years later, and there should be fireworks tonight over City Hall. But I think it's also really remarkable that the idea of a calendar date, 21st of April, existed over 2,000 years ago. The calendar we use today is still based on the archaic one that started here in Rome millennia ago. We're looking at a page from a 1935 copy of Sir Bannister Fletcher's History of Architecture on the Comparative Method. And we can see from this diagram, of course, that, uh, well, it was very Eurocentric back in the day, but also that uh, Rome lies at the root of this diagram of the tree of architecture. We can see that from Rome would grow all of the historical styles of Europe as they kind of flourished in the various branches of history. And while the ideas of Roman architecture certainly nourished the development of European historical styles, I think we'll see that the progression is a little less direct and a little more reiterative than this diagram suggests. Let's begin by looking at how Rome has recycled its material past. The term for taking this material from one time or place and reusing it again is spoils. Let's begin by looking at the House of the Crescenzi, which was built in the middle of the 11th century when most of ancient Rome lie in ruins, was buried, or had been or was being recycled in buildings all around town. We can see that the builder is inserting broken pieces of Roman marble that he has acquired into the facade of his building, decoratively being used to as lintels over the windows and the doorways. There's inscriptions and these things, decorative uh, rosettes from coffers that might have once been in the ceiling of an imperial building. Elsewhere, fancy marbles, columns, column capitals were being used to build Christian churches um, humble vernacular architecture was reusing Roman brick and maybe mm, steps as lintels for their windows and doorways. And uh, all around Rome, commercial architecture was using columns and broken marble uh, to create porticos for their shops that uh, lined the streets of medieval Rome. We can see an image here on the right of one shop, probably took a column, cut it in half, a couple broken pieces of marble and a series of arches above that, and you've got a merchant stall. And it's important to note in this photo that the doorway under between those two arches, of course, was filled in. That, that comes later in about the 16th century when they filled all of these arches back in. By the 12th and 13th centuries, the Cosmati family were creating beautiful architectural details and, and flooring for the churches of Rome out of broken pieces of Roman marble. Now, the white marble was more plentiful, and the colored marble had already been used. The large slabs had already been used, and so the Cosmati family would cut the colored marbles up into small pieces and lay them out in these kaleidoscopic patterns inset into uh, incisions in the white marble, which made a great floor slab for the church 
and uh, created the decorative patterns that we see here. From simple construction material, we could move to sculpture and uh, architectural objects. You can see in the Church of Santa Maria in Cosmadin how a very profane Roman bathtub is actually being reused here as the most sacred object in the church, its altar. If that vessel had been placed elsewhere in the church in the back, it would have been most likely a baptismal font. This practice of uh, reusing spoils continues throughout Rome's history. We see in the image on the right, a fountain constructed in Rome's Baroque era. The statues of Castor and Pollux are ancient Roman, as is the basin. And an identical basin can be found in another fountain, uh, another mile across town. The obelisk itself, of course, uh, reminds us how the Romans themselves reuse spoils. Spoils of war, obelisks brought from Egypt to decorate their stadia. And here we can see an entire building being reused as a spoil. The medieval church of San Lorenzo in Miranda was built inside of the defunct temple of Antoninus Pius, and the church facade is pulled back just far enough from the Roman columns to create a porch, which was typical for a medieval church. The Baroque facade was added to this church in a later restoration. The Church of San Nicola in Carcere, literally Santa Claus in prison, was built on top of not one, but three different temples. The north wall being built along uh, the side of one temple, its south wall being built along the exterior wall of another temple, and its interior columns laid out over the foundations of a third temple that was originally uh, built between the other two. We see two tombs uh, here converted into fortifications. The tomb of Cecilia Matella, which has been transformed into a customs house on the Appian Way, and the massive mausoleum of Hadrian, which was transformed first into a castle, the Castel Sant'Angelo, and then into a papal palace, included an escape route from the Vatican over to this fortified castle on the Tiber River. When in the Middle Ages, feudal lords ran out of hills to build their castles on, well, they turned to Roman monuments and stadia and theater were among the most popular because of course they rose up uh, above the landscape so steeply. Uh, in this image, we can see how the Savelli family built their first castle and then palace on top of the theater of Marcellus. This area today is still referred to as the Monte Savelli or the Savelli Hill in Rome. And from individual buildings, we can see how the urban fabric of ancient Rome has influenced the urban patterns that would follow in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. In this area of the Campo Marzio around the Piazza Navona, we can see on the left-hand image how the plans of the ancient buildings were built on a uh, orthogonal grid uh, running along uh, north, south, east, west axes, and how that pattern worked its way through to the fabric that we recognize in Rome today, most noticeably the Pantheon and the Piazza Navona, which is built directly above the Stadium of Domitian. In this view of the Piazza Navona, we can see how its long, elegant shape exactly recalls the stadium that once stood on this site. And while we don't know if there were obelisks in the Stadium of Domitian, in the 17th century, the popes brought an obelisk back to decorate this space and recall its Roman legacy. In the late 19th century, the Piazza della Repubblica was built directly above the foundations of the ancient baths of Diocletian. And in this case, we can see it's the water feature, the fountain, that directly recalls the legacy of this place in ancient times. Looking at the Piazza del Popolo or the Piazza di San Pietro, we might imagine that on those sites once stood a grand amphitheater like that of the Colosseum. These vast ovals uh, in the ground seem to suggest that maybe the buildings had been built on the foundations of something ancient. In fact, they're simply references to the Colosseum itself. They're the same size and the same shape as this building kilometers away in the city. On the other hand, the Colosseum itself, which just stands in an open space, uh, was systematically dismantled in the 16th century to provide stones for the church of San Pietro, just behind the piazza that you see on the left. <laughs> 
moving beyond mere material, we're going to look now at how Roman building and urban types have been uh, reiterated again and again to translate meaning across the thousands of years of use and form. First, triumphal arches, portals, and propaganda. On the Arch of Titus from the first century in Rome, we can see inscriptions and a bas-relief sculpture, including the image of a giant menorah, that are telling Roman citizens back in the capital of the empire's victory over Jerusalem. On the other hand, the Arch of Trajan in Jerash, Jordan, is built at the beginning of the second century to demonstrate the power of the emperor over his conquered people. 200 years after Hadrian, the Arch of Constantine was built. It's not strictly a triumphal arch as Constantine defeated Roman emperor to come to power. But what's interesting is to looking at the decorations. The bas-relief sculpture you see on the surface of this monument are actually taken from monuments dedicated to Hadrian and to his predecessor Trajan. This decoration represents Roman spoils used at a time when Roman sculpture was on the decline. The triumphal arch motif is used again and again throughout Western history for the Holy Roman Emperor in the ninth century, or uh, on the facade of the Pazzi Chapel in the 15th century in Florence. Even in America, the triumphal arch motif was used uh, to celebrate 100 years later the victories of George Washington. This uh, triumphal arch is found in New York City. <clears throat> And in the late 19th century, this motif was used uh, as the grand entrance to a new exhibit hall for Rome, which had just become the capital of the new Italian nation. The most famous of these is Paris's Arc de Triomphe, which dwarfs anything the Romans might have ever imagined. Kilometers away, but along the exact same axis in the suburbs of Paris, Jean Nouvel's Arc de la Défense uh, seems to mock the triumphal arch motif with a postmodern irony. <clears throat> From ideas of axis and movement, let's now look at rotundas, the idea of centrality, of unity, and of universality. One of Rome's most enduring and influential buildings is the Pantheon, built at the beginning of the second century CE. This building may have been used as a temple, it may have been used as a meeting hall, but one thing that seems certain is that the building was intended to represent the idea of the cosmos, the heavens around us. There's a giant oculus at the center of its dome allowing sunlight to penetrate from above. There are 28 rows of coffers around that dome like the 28 days of a lunar cycle. And this idea of a vast rotunda or the sphere that is implied by the proportions of this building certainly seem to signify for us some idea of universality. And the implied perfect proportions of this building are based on a simple ratio, a unity, one to one. Uh, every circle is a unity and the radius is the same all the way around. Any square inscribed inside that also has a ratio of one to one. We can see in the Pantheon how a square inscribed in the circle of its rotunda will define the shape and size of the porch outside. That same square can be seen in the section of the building and would define the height of that porch, unfortunately not built exactly as perfectly as it was designed. And in three dimensions, these shapes, of course, uh, imply a sphere. Fear. Again, this grand idea of the universal and the cosmic inside of this building. Mm -mm. These very simple but perfect ratios of one to one are found in human beings and in nature. And for millennia, they've been used to represent the connection between human beings and the universe around them. The domed rotunda has been used many times in Western architecture to represent the ideas of unity and universality. In sacred architecture, we could trace this through churches, mausolea, baptistries. And in civic architecture, the domed rotunda is one of the most important symbols for the modern democratic state. <clears throat> The geometry of the circle and the square have been used again and again in another architectural typology, that of the public library. This partie might suggest the complete collection and sharing of public knowledge. A few examples of this are Jefferson's Library for the University of Virginia, where he quite directly drew from the forms of the Pantheon. 
or Gunnar Asplund's more abstract uh, public library for the city of Stockholm, oh, where the books are laid out in uh, long halls forming a, a square around a central rotunda that is its reading room. These forms are very clear in the Exeter Library designed by Louis Kahn after his sojourn in Italy. And Italian architect Aldo Rossi used them in a more humble fashion in the Brony Elementary School years later. And now let's shift gears to see how meaning can be transferred from one type to another, from urban types to architectural types, from one building use to another, and from sacred space to civic space and back again. One of the most profound revolutions in Western history was the fall of the Western Roman Empire in the fifth century and its uh, replacement by the papacy and the conversion of the pagan world to Christianity. We might expect at this moment to see a revolution in architectural types as well. But if we look more closely at the fundamentals of Roman typology, we'll see that rather than being discarded, these Roman architectural types were actually recycled into new uses in the Christian world. Let's start with the Roman Forum. These images of the Roman Forum can show us how the space evolved into a cluttered assemblage of buildings around a central open space over hundreds of years during the Republican period. And while these buildings share an architectural style, many of them are monuments that clamor for attention in Rome's main civic space. We see many temples standing shoulder to shoulder, rising from tall flights of stairs, colonnaded meeting halls, law courts, and banks on each corner, and monumental arches, columns, and speakers platforms that all kind of compete with each other for attention in this public space. The image on the left is looking towards the Palatine Hill where the emperors built their homes and from which we derive the very word palace or palatial. And the image on the right is looking towards the Capitoline Hill. Again, in the US, we have a Capitol Hill on which our capital stands. The reason we spell capital with an O and not an A is because it's named after the Capitoline Hill in Rome. At the end of the first century BCE, the democratic Roman Republic was replaced by an empire. And as monumental as it was, the form of the haphazardly evolved Roman Forum couldn't provide the kind of singular image of power that was necessary for the new imperial state. Over the course of the next 150 years, Rome's leaders would build new imperial fora that would more clearly define the Roman citizen's place in civic space through form, through space, and through movement. A typological pattern emerges of a central space that is bound by a colonnade which organizes uh, functions behind it. Circulation that moves under that colonnade to either side and typically out the back of the forum through a series of arches. And the central space is dominated by a single temple at its rear. Unlike the covered colonnades to the side, the central space is open to the sky above. The temple is raised on a tall flight of stairs to elevate it above the profane ground. And this very theatrical setting provides a clear connection between the Roman state and Roman religion. The urban type of the imperial forum was exported to cities around the Roman Empire. We can see here Pompeii, a city that existed for hundreds of years before Rome had conquered this part of the Bay of Naples, and they redevelop its uh, civic space into the forms of an imperial fora, similar to what we saw in Rome itself. In the lower left-hand corner of this plan is a colonnaded rectangular building. It's the Roman civic basilica or law court. This building type's use in imagery would deliver the authority of Rome across the empire. In this image, I've simply enlarged and rotated the plan of the basilica and superimposed it on that of the civic forum. The organization and movement of the basilica interior is directly analogous to what we saw in the exterior Roman Forum. It's a rectangular space uh, and uh, with an entry on one of the shorter sides. 
lined by columns on the two longer sides that divide the building into a tall space in the center and shorter spaces on either side for circulation or breakout. And our eyes are drawn to the end of that space where a raised platform uh, would host a judge who stood as the image of the power of the empire in the local community. On the left-hand side of this image, you can see a series of Roman civic basilicas or law courts. The typology is very clear. It's a rectangular hall, colonnaded with an apse in the back and a raised platform for the judge. In section, it's taller in the center with clear story windows above, allowing light into the central space. In 313 CE, the Emperor Constantine legalized Christianity and he became Rome's first Christian emperor. He also imagined himself as the 13th apostle. So when Constantine began to build churches, he drew upon a very familiar typology to communicate a place of congregation, but also a symbol of authority, the Roman civic basilica or law court. The name of the new churches would also be basilica, but now it served a sacred purpose. We can see from the plans and sections of the early Christian basilicas on the right-hand side of this image, how this typology would be translated into religious buildings throughout the Roman world. We can see here the remarkable similarity between a Roman civic basilica, law court on the left-hand side built in Trier, and the early Christian basilica of Santa Sabina built on the Aventine Hill here in Rome. Both of these buildings were built in the waning century of the Roman Empire, and we can see how simple it was to convert a law court into a church, simply replace the judge's platform with a raised altar, and we convert the meaning of this building type from something civic into something mm -hmm. sacred. This typological analogy is supported by imagery and symbolism. In the absence of the law courts, the image or symbol of the emperor would have represented the authority behind a judge. In the absence of these churches, of course, it's Christ that represents the authority behind the priest. In this mosaic decorated apse from the Church of Santa Pudenziana in Rome, it dates to 383 CE and is the first of its kind, we can see the image of Christ. And he looks, well, like an emperor. He's dressed in regal clothing. He's seated on a throne. He's got a book of laws in his hands. And at his sides, we see the 12 apostles dressed in the white togas of Roman senators. I've been showing you these images not to talk about religion, but to explore how Western culture in the Roman tradition strove to maintain some continuity in the meaning of the built environment, even in the midst of a profound cultural revolution. <clears throat> and it was the recycling and reiteration of these meaningful forms and images that helped people to quickly integrate the new institutions of their rapidly evolving society. When pagan Romans worshipped, it was in the open air, standing in front of their temples. Christianity, for its first 300 years, was illegal, and so Christians couldn't do this, and they took to worshipping in private spaces, hidden away. One of the most important of these uh, spaces uh, were private homes, and after 300 years of worshipping in houses, both the layout of the new churches to follow and the organization of the mass itself would be influenced by both the plan and the section of these domestic structures. The Roman private house, or domus, uh, evolved over the course of hundreds of years. These houses had very few exterior windows, and so the key element of the party was a courtyard around which all of the living functions were arranged. When these houses were originally built, they were simple with a single courtyard, and we called these atrium houses. But as society got more affluent, Romans were building larger houses and added a second courtyard to the back of their house. We called the second courtyard a peristyle. The peristyle house is organized around an axis, and while there are many variations on this plan, and this axis might bend along the way, typically there's an important sequence of significant spaces that we encounter as we progress through the house. We begin uh, this spatial sequence by stepping from the street into a vestibule, labeled as A on this plan. And through the vestibule, we step into the first of these courtyards, called the atrium, here labeled B. 
The atrium is open to the sky above, letting in light and air, but also letting in rain, which is collected in a basin in the floor, the impluvium, and carried away into a reservoir below that. So there's an important water feature right in this first room. Off of the atrium is the office of the master of the house, here labeled with the letter E. It's called a tablinum, and it typically had wooden doors on either side that sw uh, swung or, or, or slid open and would allow the house to open up either to the front room publicly towards the street or through the house all the way into the back, more private part of the house, the peristyle. As we step into the peristyle, we find a, a colonnaded uh, court, uh, usually larger than the atrium. In the center of this space, we find a green space, a garden. And uh, we circulate along a hardscape along the sides of that garden until we arrive at the back of the house where typically there would be a private dining room here labeled G in plan. When early Christians began to worship in these houses, the mass probably took place in the back, more private part of the house, far away from the street. Congregants would have stood in the peristyle F on this plan around the colonnade, and the priest uh, probably officiating from the dining room, G, in the back. The most uh, important moment in the celebration of the Mass is the celebration of the Eucharist, which is the reenactment of the Last Supper. So this dining room space perhaps added additional significance. After 300 years, when Christians began to build churches, they often converted these houses of worship into actual official churches. And we can see a, a very clear relationship between the organization of the house and the organization of these early Christian churches that followed. Yeah. A remarkable example of this phenomenon is the Church of San Clemente in Rome. We're looking at the plan of the 12th century church, which is built directly on top of the plan of a 4th century church, which itself was the conversion of a 1st century house that had probably been used for worship since at least the 2nd century. As these houses are converted into churches, the significant rooms along this axis become formalized into the new spaces of the early Christian church. We enter the church by passing from the street across a small porch into a courtyard, which like that of the house is called an atrium. In the center of this courtyard is typically a water feature, a fountain like we saw in the center of the Roman house. This fountain uh, provides for either a ritualistic or an actual cleansing with water before we enter into the more sacred space of the church. The colonnade at the back of this courtyard serves as a threshold for the interior space. And in early Christian churches, often there wasn't a solid wall at the back of this church, but a double colonnade across which uh, tapestries would be hung. So this also recalls very closely the tablinum of the Roman house, which uh, had doors that could open or close to render that interior space more or less private. Entering the nave, we see a large colonnaded rectangular space higher in the center, allowing light to enter into its central space and circulation along its darker side aisles. In the back of this space is the apse, which of course is analogous to the dining room in the Roman house. And in this apse, we have a raised presbytery on which stands an altar where the priest would officiate the mass. The planned section and spatial sequences of these two building types uh, are remarkably similar. And for hundreds of years before the building of the first Christian basilicas, the organization of the mass, the uh, placement of liturgical furniture, the position of congregants and priests, uh, processional roofs would have all developed uh, over time in houses like this. And so the early Christian basilica that evolves after Constantine's legalization of Christianity is not the evolution of one type or another, but it's actually the hybrid of multiple types. In this case, the Roman law court and the Roman house. In fact, the name for this new uh, building type is Basilica id est Dominicum, or the basilica that is the house of God. This story is still a little more complex and yet more interesting. 
Remember that pagan Romans worshipped out of doors, standing in front of their temples, and one innovation of Christianity was to move inside. But the interior of these houses was open to the sky above. Remember also that the Roman basilica itself uh, was similar to the form of the imperial fora, open to the sky above, colonnaded on either side, with a raised important temple space at the back. So as Christians began using these new basilicas, they seem to begin to imagine them as outdoor spaces by placing canopies over their altars, a kind of structure inside of a structure, as if the nave were open to the sky above. <clears throat> And the back wall of these churches around the grand arch of the apse are often decorated with symbols of the victory of good over evil at the battle at the end of time, the Battle of Armageddon. There's an architectural term for this back wall. Not surprisingly, it's called a triumphal arch. For the next few slides, we'll continue to consider the Roman domus, but no longer its relationship to a religious building, but to an urban form, not just the form of a public space, but the shape of the city itself. In particular, the Roman castrum plan. Roman planning was very direct, very orthogonal, usually organized around centralized spaces and uh, axes. And as we've seen, they tend to replicate parties at different scales for both urban and architectural typologies. So when Republican Rome begins building new towns for its army across its territories, the form of those towns might look familiar to us. This new town planning type was called Castrum, and that name might sound familiar to us as well. Any town in England uh, like Winchester, Manchester, Colchester reminds us of its Roman Castrum origins in its name today. These cities were functional and they were defensible, and their right angles made them relatively easy to be built by Roman soldiers throughout the uh, Roman territories. The cities were bisected by two streets running in the cardinal directions, which penetrated their perimeter walls through four gates. The street running from east to west is called the Decomanus, and the street running from north to south is the Roman Cardus, from which we derive the word cardinal, as in cardinal directions. These streets bisect the city uh, into four uh, quarters, a term that we still use today, and these quarters would serve different purposes for you know, living, for industry, for administration, etc. And at the center of the city was the main public space called the Forum, a Latin word that literally means whole, an open space, uh, public gathering space in the center of the city. At the turn of the fourth century, the emperor Diocletian built an enormous palace for himself in Dalmatia. And uh, the palace is, of course, a single house for the emperor, but built at the size of a city. And we can see in this plan the analogous um, image of both the Roman atrium house and uh, the castrum town. Over the centuries, this palace is abandoned and a city grows up on its site. Today, that city is called Split. Looking at these two images, we can see the strong party relationship between these two typologies at the urban scale and at the architectural scale, a house that is like a city and a city that is like a house. These architectural and urban types wane during the Middle Ages. But in the Renaissance, architects were looking back at classical models to modernize their new buildings. The Renaissance palace in Italy has a lot in common with the Roman domus. Uh, like its predecessor, it's arranged around a central courtyard. And if the family had enough money for more property, along that central axis, they would place it to the peristyle of the Roman house. The other important feature of this new style was the use of classical elements and ornamentation. And so in the courtyards of these new houses, we would see uh, arcades made up of classical columns uh, stacked uh, several stories tall. While the wealthy private families of Florence are building these palazzi at the beginning of the 15th century, 
Brunelleschi is designing a different kind of house. This one is a communal house for a group of people, not just for one family. It's the orphanage for the city of Florence. And we call it the Foundling Hospital. The plan of this new house for the orphans of Florence is familiar to us. It's an orthogonal block that's designed around two courtyards, the central square one being on axis with the main entrance to the building. Brunelleschi is also reiterating a classical language into a new Renaissance style in his columns, capitals, arches, uh, architectural window detailing, etc. And he's reintroducing the idea of a unity. His uh, central courtyard is a one-to-one -one ratio. The columns on the front of the building are as far apart as they are tall, and the, the bay of that uh, porch is exactly as deep as the width of uh, two columns. So we're creating a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio, a kind of cube of space under each one of those uh, column bays. And so the ratios and proportions of the human body and this idea of a universal shared space come back to us at the very heart of this project. Brunelleschi's reinterpretation of classical architecture would be broadly influential for generations to come. And importantly, it had a profound influence on the public space in front of the Foundling Hospital itself. Before there was an orphanage, on this site stood the church of the Santissima Annunziata, and its facade was on axis with the dome of Florence's cathedral. Brunelleschi's classical architecture was so influential that over the course of the next century, those uh, classical columns and arches, their proportions, and the porch of its building would be repeated on three sides of this piazza. Brunelleschi's facade was mirrored on the opposite side of the piazza's central axis, and the church's porch was articulated with a slightly higher arch at its center. And so again, we're seeing an analogy between an architectural and an urban typology, as Brunelleschi's central courtyard was able to unify the complex functions of the building that surrounded it. So was this new colonnade of the piazza able to unify the functions of the various buildings around it. And the urban space reads like the courtyard of a neighborhood, as the courtyard is the central space of the Foundling Hospital itself. And once again, we can see how these ideas get reiterated into an even larger urban typology. In this plan of central Florence, we can see in the upper right-hand corner the uh, Piazza Santissima Annunziata and its axial relationship with the dome of the Duomo of Florence. The Duomo itself was built in the northeastern corner of a Roman castrum city, which was built by Julius Caesar on the banks of the Arno River in the first century BCE. And we can see the outline of that castrum city directly below the modern plan of Florence itself. At the center of Florence is today's Piazza della Repubblica, the main space in the center of the historical city built on top of the old Roman Forum. And the house is city, city is house analogy is clear to us again. We see the plan of the Foundling Hospital and how similar it is to that of the Castrum city of Florence. And Florence's late 19th century planners went so far as to build a triumphal arch-like gateway right over the Roman Decumanus in the center of the Piazza della Repubblica, celebrating the renovation of the city from its medieval fabric. We return to the apse mosaic of the church of uh, Santa Pudenziana, this time not to look at its central figures, but to look at what's behind them. And what do we see but a city? The Bible begins in a garden, but it ends in a city. And we see here the depiction of the heavenly Jerusalem, that is heaven depicted as a Roman city, the Roman buildings inside, a defensive wall around it. And at the center of this city, we see a gold cross. We might associate that with Christ. But if we remember that the streets of heaven are paved with gold, it's perfectly reasonable to interpret this as the cardo and decumanus of the Roman city that is heaven. And the image of a Roman city is recycled once more as a place of protection, of order, and of authority.
I began by looking at the recycling of Roman material and then the reiteration of form and typology. And I'd like to conclude by just having a quick look at the use and adaptation of pure metaphor to convey meaning across uh, many centuries and cultural rupture. The term is Pontifex Maximus. We return to this image of the house of the Crescenzi, the wealthy medieval family I told you about at the beginning of the lecture. Well, I didn't tell you how they made their money. They were bridge keepers. This house was on the bank of the Tiber River, and there was an ancient Roman bridge at this point at the time. The people who made these bridges back in ancient times were referred to as a pontifex. The word ponte is uh, Latin for bridge. And this became a handy metaphorical term for the priests of pagan Rome. They referred to themselves as a pontifex, a kind of metaphorical bridge keeper between uh, the humans and the gods above them. Well, the chief priest of the pagan Roman world was the Pontifex Maximus. And when uh, the emperor took political power, he also took power over all of Roman religion. And he was referred to as well as the Pontifex Maximus. With the fall of the Roman Empire and the emperor, the pope came into power, not just political power, but of course also uh, religious power. And the term was transferred to the pope. At that point, he was referred to as the Pontifex Maximus. As a bridge keeper to the Christian world, the Pope is commonly referred to as Pontifex Maximus in inscriptions on monuments and churches. And to save space, this term is usually abbreviated to Pont Max or simply PM. In this inscription from 1838, we can see Pope Gregory XVI referred to as Pontiff Maxim. And of course, Pontiff is a term that we commonly use today to refer to the Pope. The inscription goes on to describe how Pope Gregory had used ancient Roman columns taken from the nearby town of Vey to decorate the porch of this building. And so even in the 19th century, we can see how spoils are being used to both decorate buildings and to make a direct connections back to the ancient world. And this brings us up to the 21st century. We've been talking about recycling and reiteration, about cultural rupture and revolution. And someone once said a revolution really just means going around in circle and coming back to where you started again. In the last decade, the popes started tweeting out their communications to the faithful. And what uh, handle did they choose for the papal tweets? At Pontifex, a term that has moved from the material to the metaphorical and now into the digital world. And I hope that I've demonstrated that the real legacy of Rome is neither material nor stylistic, and that simple ideas can become very subtly complex when we reinterpret them again and again over time. Thank you. I'm going to uh, try to get my video back on, and uh, I don't know if there's any questions after all of that, but I'll be happy to take them or, or talk about anything you'd like to, Sam. <clears throat> I um, will kick off uh, with a question and um, thanks, Scott. I mean, a really great lecture um, and kind of cyclical uh, in nature. So um, your, your theme is, is complete. I do have a question though about the, the concept of the forum, for instance, being used, the spoils of the forum being used um, for constructs. Was there really much respect given to the forum prior to it officially being sanctioned be because of its pagan nature? I mean, you know, we, we know that that once it was declared, those structures were declared pagan and therefore up for whatever needed to be done for them. I mean, how much respect was given to them prior to that? Well, that is a great question because there's a, a real ambiguity here and a real irony because for hundreds of years uh, after the fall, well, after, let's say, after the fall of ancient Rome, first remember, uh, Christianity, uh, Christianity is legalized in 313. Um, and then over the course of that century, there is this kind of, you know, vacillation between an acceptance of it and then an oppression of it and an acceptance of it. But by just three generations later, 
the tables have been completely turned and paganism is outlawed in the last decade of the fourth century. So at that point, the pagan temples are all shut down. And that's one of the reasons that we might suspect that the Pantheon was a temple because it was also shut down in this period. And for several hundred years, those buildings were really taboo. The doors were kind of locked up on them. And it really isn't until the 600s when the actual buildings start getting used again and getting converted into churches, like we saw the Church of San Lorenzo, for example, there inside of the plan of the Temple of Antoninus Pius. So the actual physical places were taboo. But what's so interesting is that so many of these ideas were just literally reinterpreted, you know, so that, uh, uh, so that, you know, people would have something recognizable to, to kind of cling to. And so that, you know, this power that was now changing could use forms that people already knew to reinstigate a kind of authority uh, and to communicate to them very easily. And so uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting, I think for me, it's one of the most interesting moments in Rome. But I think your question is, is excellent because it really points to this ambiguity between uh, eschewing the use of the actual physical place, but really kind of almost subconsciously uh, really reusing the typology of many of these places, uh, uh, you know, just very, you know, uh, with, with very little change. Interesting, kind of letting the ghosts go away before they <laughs> go back at it. Um, does anybody else have a question for Scott? Boy, because um, I, I definitely um, have additional uh, questions. Um, you had mentioned that the um, the Castel Sant'Angelo in Rome had that passage between the Vatican and the castle. Is that is that passage still there? I mean, is it still? Yeah, it's thing? it's yeah, it's still there. And I had the great opportunity to walk through a good portion of it uh, several years ago. I was visiting the Castel San Angelo at night and they'd open that thing up and you could go, I don't know, several hundred meters uh, down the thing. And, and it was an escape route literally from the Vatican Palace. It ran through the Borgo Pio. It's high above the street. Uh, so what you really see at the street are a series of arches. And then above that, what looks like an aqueduct. Uh, but instead of water running through this thing, the Pope could escape from the Vatican. No one would know where he was in this tunnel and then pop up inside of the Castel San Angelo. And uh, the Pope actually took refuge uh, inside of the Castel Sant'Angelo for almost a year while the city was under uh, siege. And, um, uh, and so, you know, it proved to be effective. Isn't that when a, a lot of the Swiss guards sacrificed themselves for that escape, didn't they? Well, I, I don't know in that particular instance, but that's what their, their job is to do is to protect the Pope and, and they've certain they've been doing it for centuries. They're still there today. They take that job seriously. They look kind of, um, you know, anachronistic standing there in those kind of blue and yellow uniforms. Michelangelo designed those, uh, but they're actually trained, you know, bodyguards. And um, I wouldn't mess with one uh, for sure, even though, you know, the tourists want to go up and take pictures with them. I suppose it's like you do at Buckingham Palace. Uh, you might try to make one of those uh, guards smile, but I, I'm sure they're they're well trained to protect uh, the, the the queen in her palace the same way the Swiss guards are there to protect the pope. Are they still recruited from Switzerland? Yeah, they are. Yeah, they are certainly. Um, again, I guess an irony because you know Switzerland is still kind of identified as as much as a Protestant, um, you know, more or less um, country as opposed to Catholic. Yeah, they were, but I think feelings run much higher here. Often throughout history, uh, you know, uh, we look outside of our own territory. Uh, we hire somebody to be an authority. We hire, well, the Romans, for example, the police in Rome um, were actually all foreigners. They were brought in from outside of Rome from the territories because they didn't want anyone in Rome to have power over the police and then be able to control the city. And we see this in the Middle Ages. Uh, very often medieval cities would hire what they called a podesta, an outside authority to come in and run the city so that that person wouldn't be beholden to any one family or another in the city. And I think it's the same way with the Swiss guards. The Pope hasn't always been popular in Rome. And uh, uh, many times uh, he's been either run out of town. Uh, uh, he himself was attacked by the Romans. 
or, or his body was, you know, attempted to be thrown into the river, you know, during a funeral procession because, uh, you know, he, he wasn't always the most popular person here at home. We discussed in this class a similar situation with the Janissary, for instance. Um, the uh, the corps recruited to protect the the um, the sultan or the Mehmed in particular the Ottoman um, sultan. Um, I was curious about your opinions on the facade of the Pantheon. You you'd mentioned you know that yep. that has there been any new scholarship or is there is there really anything concrete about why uh, the facade or if the facade was in fact um, originally designed to be higher than it is now the portico. Yeah, I think it's really clear just looking at it. If you stand in front of the building and you look at it, that the facade was intended to be taller than it is, about uh, 10 meters taller than it is. And I'm sorry, not 10 meters, but 10 feet taller than it is. And if you look uh, back at the kind of rectangular block that stands between the um, porch uh, of, the, of the Pantheon and the drum behind it, you can actually see where there's a, a triangular pediment, you know, kind of uh, built into the front of that, which would have been, you know, of course, the place where the, the, the pediment today, you know, kind of would have fit into that space. Uh, and the proportions are off. If you look in plan, you can literally go into the building, you know, standing in front of the building, you can see that the proportions are off on this thing. Um, so it's, uh, the, you know, the columns are about 40 feet tall, they should have been uh, 50. And so I think, you know, uh, there's little dispute that the porch was built smaller than it was intended to be. And we could see in that section how that rectangle, you know, would have described the exact shape of this thing. Why that is, uh, nobody really actually knows. I mean, those are monolithic uh, columns. Uh, they were uh, quarried in Egypt. They had to be dragged 100 miles through, you know, the desert. Then they were put on a barge taken down the Nile. They were, you know, floated across the the uh, the Mediterranean. They arrived in Austria. They came up the river on a boat, and then they were, you know, kind of dragged over to the Pantheon. So it was very difficult to make those things. And you know, perhaps they couldn't get their hands on taller columns, maybe the columns sang in the Mediterranean, you know, we don't really know. But I asked one of the real authorities on the Pantheon, uh, who is Mark Wilson Jones, I was visiting the building once uh, with him. And I asked him a few questions like this about some of the unknowns of the Pantheon. And, and he said, from his point of view, as a real scholar of that building, that some questions are really just not at this moment worth asking. And he said, you know, ask the questions that you actually have a chance to answer, but just don't, you know, waste much time thinking about those things that we really will never find out the answer to. Yeah, I guess <clears throat> I'm only curious, you know, because, you know, is it a logistical thing? Is it a construction thing? Um, you know, it, it, was it, uh, like I say, a logistical thing? Is it the shipbuilding? You know, where, did we design it before we knew that maybe a ship couldn't transport a column, you know, uh, arguably across the Mediterranean that tall or that right. long? But we've, yeah, we've seen obelisks move that distance, so it's possible, right? Yeah, exactly. It might have been also might have been a construction time problem. Although I, I tend not to believe that. At this, you know, Hadrian uh, wanted to get this building built, uh, you know, more quickly. Perhaps you know they they couldn't get their hands on those taller columns in time, and they and they rushed the construction. But I find that a little bit hard to believe with a building of this stature and an emperor of that stature. There's one other really interesting thing that we know about the, 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 the construction of this facade, um, and that is um, that there's actually a template uh, for the cutting of the stones at the facade of the Pantheon that is found in the marble paving in front of the mausoleum of Augustus, which is about a, a kilometer exactly, exactly due north of the Colosseum. And during the Second World War, they were excavating down there and they found these lines that were cut on the pavement right in front of the mausoleum and they weren't sure what they were. And it took several decades for scholars to figure out that it was a template for the cutting of the stones of the facade of the Pantheon. And it kind of makes sense if you think about it because this was a large, large flat marble area in front of a mausoleum whose uh, you know, chief occupant had already died over a century before. And it was just really a few dozens of feet from the Tiber River and there was a port there. Uh, and so it would have been a convenient place to bring stones up or down the river, uh, bring them to that place and then cut them to the sizes as you saw in the template, just like a seamstress, you know, would cut cloth out of a, out of a, out of a you know, out of a pattern or I designed a house uh, for someone once and uh, the contractor actually built a pattern for the roof trusses. He drew it right on the on the floor of the living room and he built all the roof trusses down there uh, uh, on the plywood flooring. Of course, that all got covered up when they put in the, the finished flooring. 
but we found the exact same thing right in front of the Pantheon. Interesting. I have one last question for you, um, Scott, and that's bringing us back to the early Christian era. And you had mentioned um, the uh, San Clemente, and that that little that that little uh, pergola, that little enclosure over where the priest would stand. But what I'm also curious about is that little walled enclosure that's directly in front of that space. Um, yeah, what absolutely. would have that have been for? I mean, who would have been well, privileged enough to be inside that? Right, and this is another really interesting question and it kind of comes back uh, to the first question that you ask here. So um, the, the name of the canopy is, a, the formal name is a baldacchino, but we can just call it a canopy. And um, that idea of that element really is to kind of recreate the idea of uh, what the Romans called uh, a templum minus, uh, a minor temple. Uh, and uh, you can see this even in, uh, if you look in uh, Corbusier's towards an architecture, he has a diagram of this thing. So, uh, you know, the ancients to create a sacred space in, a, in the desert, for example, they would just drive four posts in the ground or multiple posts in the ground to, uh, to kind of de delineate between a sacred space inside and a profane space outside. They might hang fabric or something in between those things. You just put an altar in the middle of it. And the gods could look down from above and see that thing. Um, the Hebrews would erect a canopy out in the desert, you know, uh, above an altar as a, as a way to create a sacred space. And so this kind of baldacchino we see in the church seems certainly to recall that as if it were a canopy in the open air. But this other element that you mentioned is really, really fascinating. And you see them in medieval churches uh, constructed, especially in the ninth and, and, and in the 10th centuries. And they're called, they're choir screens. Um, and so that area is there to, uh, to enclose a space for the choir to sit. There are many priests associated with the church. And so the choir would sit inside of there and the priest might come, go up on a pulpit and, and read a sermon or something to the people. Um, but it does something else, which is, I think, really interesting, um, is it separates us, the congregant, from the altar. And so if in Roman times um, there was a temple in a field and the people stood outside of it, the altar was actually on the steps of that temple or maybe just in front of it. And the people stood away from that kind of respectfully. But in the early Christian church, people were getting just too close to the altar. You know, They really didn't know what to do in this space. And so they were kind of crowding in on the priest. And so they actually started building screens to keep people away, to keep the hands off of the altar, you know, and away from the priest. And these became more and more elaborate and they became larger until eventually the congregates are actually quite far away from the altar. And, you know, the last, I think, maybe interesting thing about this is that in, um, in, the, in the Middle Ages, the, the priest is actually turning his back to the, um, turning his back uh, at some point to the, uh, to the congregation and kind of mumbling through the sermon and they don't know what's going on. So they would actually hang pictures off of some of these screens so that you could kind of imagine what was happening, these rude screens. So we can still see all of these elements in churches today, even though they're not quite being used that way any longer. How interesting though, that, that we have a, a situation where architecture is reacting to the occupants. Um, in and, that yeah, and that's the beauty of these types. And, and that's why for me, this one particular moment is, is really so interesting because, you know, we're, it's a rupture that everything should change. But actually, you know, as one said, you know, things had to change so they could remain the same. And everything is changing, but in some ways, everything is remaining the same. And a little bit over time, over the centuries, uh, these types kind of evolve to recreate these situations. And, uh, and that's the other beautiful thing about types. When you're looking at Rome, you've got something where these buildings have existed for thousands of years is they've had time to evolve. You can follow that evolution very, very, very carefully. And, you know, it, it's, it, it reveals some pretty interesting things about human nature. It's interesting where we see them, uh, you know, adopt, adapt, and where they break from that, for that identity, that, that moment of, of, of architectural reaction to, to create an identity, uh, you know, that choice of the basilica. I mean, we've talked about that in this class as well, is that, you know, that how metaphorically important that was because it's not the temple, it's the people's house um, and, and a very intentional adoption and adaptation um, to Christianity. So, 
Yeah, it's again, I, I, for me, it's a rather fascinating moment because it tells us something about human psychology. And we see it, I mentioned, you could see it in some of the imagery that I showed you there, the Church of Santo Pudenciano. I mean, that's the first apps mosaic that we have in showing Christ, you know, 383. Um, CE and you know it's very clear that he, he looks like an emperor um, uh, so th you know they're trying to communicate something to people in, in a form that they would uh, immediately uh, recognize but it doesn't start there I mean it doesn't just stop there um, I the image of, um, uh, of, a, of a lamb for example uh, which is a really curious one we see him in churches all the time uh, a lamb is a symbol of, of something to be sacrificed on an altar uh, so that makes plenty of sense but Christ is also depicted as a shepherd. He's out there to save, you know, lost souls. And so there's a, you know, a, a direct contradiction in this one kind of central image that we see there. But interestingly, the, the, the idea of a good shepherd, the image of a good shepherd, uh, a man carrying a sheep on his back, the lost sheep, is not actually originally a Christian one. It's a, it's a pagan one. The Romans use that same image and we can see statues, Roman statues of the good shepherd that then actually get reused and placed inside of Christian churches. So sometimes it's extremely direct. Isaac, did you have a question? Yeah, I had a question. Uh, going back to the Ark of Constantine, I actually built a scale model of it last semester, but I wanted to know more about like the, the surface of it. Um, I know that it was built from different pieces of, 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 of things, but um, I wanted to know, like, do we know where those uh, those surfaces came from? And if it was like built at different time time periods? Well, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, it, it was built. Uh, well, it was all built at one moment in time, but the material comes from, from different sources. So the interior of that thing is going to be made out of stone and, and cement and you know, rubble and things like that. Only the outside surface is made out of marble. Um, and so, you know, it's surfaced in marble slabs. Um, the inscription at the top of this thing is dedicated to Constantine, and there's a few other small elements that were actually created for his time. Uh, but most of those uh, sculptural pieces that you see there either date to the time of Hadrian or to the time of Trajan. And they, they took hunting scenes and they converted them into battle scenes, for example, um, in order to recycle these things. So it's interesting that even in Roman times, this use of this idea of spoils, of reusing materials, um, is already happening. And, and this is happening in the time of Constantine because by the fourth century, you know, the art of sculpture is already on the decline in Rome. Constantine is building a new city, Constantinople. Uh, today, it's, that's Istanbul. And he's going to move the capital over there. And so where are all of the artisans? Where are the builders? They're off in, in Constantinople, you know, building new monuments. They're not there in Rome to build ones like this. Um, and, and so, you know, we, we can see these kind of traits that we're going to see a little bit later already, you know, happening in, in Roman times. And um, this was also because of expediency, wasn't it? I mean, it was it was in order to get it done and get it done quickly, wasn't it, Scott? I mean, wasn't that part of this element? Well, of grabbing these. Elements? I think it's ex it's expediency, it's economy. As I said, it's a lack of actual skilled labor. I mean, these are all problems that we still have today. And of course, it's possible because, well, Trajan and Hadrian, they've been dead for 200 years. What, what have they done for us lately? You know, nothing. So we can reuse that sculpture again, um, uh, you know, in a, in a new monument like this one. I think the other remarkable thing is that between the um, Arch of Hadrian that I'd shown in the previous slide and the Arch of Constantine, are 200 years of architectural uh, um, history. And can you imagine a form, you know, from the time of uh, George Washington that would still be so, um, uh, uh, so kind of reusable in the, at the end of the 20th century, something that, you know, had never really gone out of style. Thank you, that answers my question. It's, it's actually yeah, quite amazing the how they uh, started to recycle since then and they started to use that in different time periods, but it still yeah. lives vividly in history uh, and still there. Well, the Romans were very frugal people. <laughs> you know, I don't think they ever threw anything away. Yeah. Well, and it's, and it's interesting that we've seen cultures, including the Romans, um, in, for instance, the Flavian Amphitheater was in part a way to try and get rid of the memory of, of Nero, the erasure of, of the pre previous. You know, we see that in Egypt, and we've seen it in many of the other cultures, that desire to actually remove memory intentionally um, as opposed to just repurposing, right, recycling. 
Well, you know, that happens again and again. And on these triumphal arches, for example, I didn't show this one, um, but on the triumphal arch of Septimius Severus, which is right in the Roman Forum, um, there are inscriptions uh, 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 and actually sculpture that relates not only to Septimius, but also to his two sons, to Gaius and to, uh, to um, Caracalla. But, you know, we've never heard of Emperor Gaius, but we've heard of the Emperor Caracalla because Caracalla came to power and he had his brother killed and he had his face chiseled off of that monument. He had his name chiseled out of the inscription. Um, and, you know, today we can look up the inscription and we can and see exactly where the words were changed, where the, where, the, where the names were changed on that thing. Thank Scott you. For again. The, that was an amazing lecture. Thank you. I really, thank, thank, thank you so again, much. Scott. I before that. we go, does anybody else have any one last question for Scott before we, we let him go? It's late at his time. It's probably uh, past, well past dinner for you, Scott. Well, we eat here, we eat late here, uh, but um, I appreciate the questions and, and I really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, you know, to talk to you all a little bit about Rome. I hope some of you will make it over here and we're going to see, you know, some of these places in person. Uh, the Church of San Clemente that I pointed out that Sam referred back to, you know, we'll see the upper church of that. We'll go down actually into the lower church from the fourth century. And then we'll actually go down below that into this house from the first century. By the time we're done, we're about 35 feet underground. Around and, and there's still more ancient architecture underneath that uh, uh, to be explored. It is absolutely an opportunity that, that uh, you will never forget um, or regret. Uh, and it's life changing should you get that opportunity to go over there. And, and nobody's a better uh, uh, mentor to keep you guys uh, in line and, and educated over there than Scott. Scott, thank you so much for this lecture. Um, and um, this is going to make a great um, addition to this class. And I look forward to seeing you sometime soon. I can't wait to see you as soon as that's uh, safe and possible. And again, thank you very, very much for this opportunity to talk to the students. Great. Thanks, everybody. We'll see everybody um, on Friday.